All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this talk. Uh, we are very excited to have uh, two speakers here from uh, Lydia AI. Uh, this talk is going to be on opening the uh, machine learning black box in regulated industries with um, Hannah and Spark. Uh, my name is Faraz, and I'm one of the um, co-organizers here at TMLS. Um, just before we get started, um, uh, if you do have any questions, um, please feel free to ask them in the chat with the queue in front. And lastly, uh, please do visit our booths on the left, um, um, including um, including the team from uh, Lydia AI, um, to hear more about the companies, the uh, roles that they're hiring for, as well as for a chance to win some giveaways. Um, so it's my absolute pleasure to introduce um, Hannah and Spa. Um, Hannah is the uh, machine learning researcher at um, Lydia AI where she focuses on discovering and applying the best um, ML techniques to healthcare and um, insurance problems to help, to help um, insurers use uh, machine learning to protect more people. Hannah um, completed her um, MSc in biomedical engineering and specializes in machine learning, deep learning, and computer vision. And lastly, Spark is the applied uh, data scientist at um, Lydia AI, where he focuses on building frameworks to help companies use uh, machine learning to protect more people. Uh, Spark is working towards his PhD in um, statistics and specializes in the application of ML methods in property and um, casualty loss modeling and risk selection. So welcome and over to you both. Okay, so thank you so much Paris, for this introduction. And I just want to thank everyone for joining Spark and I uh, for this presentation, which is opening the machine learning black box in regulated industries. So briefly to give you some background in Lydia AI, our clients are insurance companies. And the goal of Lydia AI is to use dynamic data to create accurate and continuous risk predictions in order to allow personalized recommendations based on the personal health score. And by doing this, hopefully reduce the number of uninsurable people. So today in this presentation, through a case study, we're gonna talk about the journey that brought our ML team, actuaries and underwriters to work together and collaborate to create Lydia AI health score. And um, this case study is about how we opened the ML black box and made it work with actuaries and underwriters for risk sensitive decisions. And in our context, um, when we talk about opening the black box, we doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean looking at all the technical details and modern interpretability and these challenges in deep learning models, but we wanna focus on how our ML team were able to open their work to other professionals in such ways that they can understand and are comfortable with uh, the model uh, predictions and to convince them that the ML models are actually making sensible and reliable predictions so that the other stakeholders are no longer think of ML models as a black box. And this, uh, the framework that we're gonna talk today, it's not just for the insurance field and with some modification, it can be applied to any other industry that are dealing with risk sensitive decisions like underwriting for bank loans and credit approvals. So we're gonna talk about when we had a model that you can see the famous ROC and precision recall curves here. And we thought that we were doing well. However, when we take this model to our uh, actuaries, this model actually got rejected. And we're going to talk about what we needed to do and the framework that we had to come up with in order to go from this rejected model um, to something that got approved at the end of this journey. And you can see one of the performance plots for this approved model at the right side here. And this might not be uh, familiar to many of you in the ML field. So we're gonna talk about the journey that brought us here. And um, in order to make our ML models accepted by both actuaries and underwriters, we had to come up with a validation framework. And because actuaries and underwriters have different ways to approach the same problem, actuaries deal with macro level population data while underwriters deal on a case by case level. And they also have different expectations from the ML model. It was very important to use different methods and techniques to validate our model based on their expectations. 
So here we're going to talk about the different techniques that we, we, we implemented to do that. And um, in addition, the, the validation framework allowed us to better collaborate with actuaries and underwriters, understand their perspective, and also validate our ML models. So the case study that we want to focus today is the problem of accelerating underwriting practice for insurance. So you see the flowchart, and in the bottom of this flowchart, you can see the traditional way of insurance underwriting. So when someone wants to buy an insurance product, an underwriter will uh, assess their health status. For example, by asking them to fill a questionnaire or by asking them to have a medical exam. And after this assessment, healthy individuals will get a standard rating, which means that they're healthy, they have higher risk of insurance company, and uh, the substandard group actually might uh, pay a higher price for the insurance product. And if someone is very unhealthy and considered as high risk, they may be declined and not issued an insurance policy at all. So this underwriting process that I explained typically takes three weeks to complete, and it requires a lot of administrative work, which is costly both in terms of time and also money. So we wanted to accelerate this process with the help of an AI uh, health score, as shown at the top of this um, flowchart. And the health score is calculated based on person's medical history, and it can be used to measure the health status of an individual and also the risk that they have to the insurance company. So the lower the health score, the healthier the individual and the lower the risk to the insurance company. The health score can be used to then pre-select the people who are gonna be to have a standard rating so that these people can then bypass the traditional underwriting process and um, avoid the unnecessary medical exams and just get the insurance product faster. And then for everyone else that are not selected, they will just go through the standard underwriting process. So nothing really changes for them. So this is how our ML team approached the problem of generating the AI health score, which is actually very similar to any other ML workflow. So we looked at electronic health record data as our data source, and then we did extensive data analysis to clean the data, understand the data biases, and create data sets that are representative of our clients and target population. We then performed feature engineering and feature selection based on our data and trained supervised models to predict different diseases. And next, we optimized these models using the common ML metrics and then um, by combining the prediction results, we were able to generate an AI-based uh, health score. So then once we had the optimal AI model, we shared this with our internal actuary. And the first lesson that we learned here was that actuaries are not very really familiar with these uh, typical ML performance plots, and they actually care more about incident rate plots. So what is incident rate? Um, incident rate can be used to describe the likelihood of an event of an interest. For example, for mortality, the incident rate is a probability of death or the mortality rate for a particular population. Uh, for hospitalization, for example, it represents how often someone visits the hospital each year. Uh, so we created the incident rate plots for different age groups and genders, and then we shared these plots uh, with our actuary. And uh, this model actually was rejected because it does not conform with the expectation. And the reason that the model was rejected was that what matters most for actuaries is that the model agrees with their expectation and experience. So in this case, um, they were looking at how reasonable the incident rate plots are and how well they can be explained. For example, they wanted to see a monotonically increasing pattern of the incident rate as the score goes up because a lower score would indicate healthier people, so they should have lower risk. However, um, in this plot, you can see that this monotonic pattern is actually missing. For example, the incident rate for people with scores between 0.3 and 0.4, and also for scores between 0.7 and 0.8, is actually lower than those with lower scores, which is not uh, preferred. Also, um, the red dashed line that you can see in the plot uh, shows the insurer's benchmark for incident rates. And because we want to select healthier people with lower scores, 
these people are expected to have lower incidence rates compared with the general population. And this was not the case here. For example, the lowest two score brackets that are shown with the red box here are actually riskier than the benchmark. So in short, these, this model is producing results which don't make sense to the actuaries, which was precisely the reason that the model got rejected. So in order to address the actuary's feedback, we incorporated the metrics that they care during our model training and optimizing. For example, we created customized actuarial objective function to emphasize an expected pattern of the incident rate. And after incorporating these metrics in the, uh, some iterations, we were then able to come up with another model that produces the incident rate plots that you can see here on the right. And uh, if you look at these plots now, we can see that we have a monotonically increasing pattern. And so that's, that's, that's good. And in addition, people with the lowest score are all healthier compared to the general population. And um, both of these observations indicated that we have a much better agreement overall with the actuaries. And that was the reason that we finally get, got approval for this improved model. So during this back and forth communication with actuaries, we learned a couple of lessons. So we learned that our ML team and actuaries are approaching the same problem from very different perspectives. For example, we're using different data sources. Traditionally, actuaries work with population data on a macro level while we're using personalized health data. We also have different requirements for the model. For actuaries, they may be custom to explicit mathematical formulas in the models. And because of that, interpretability is very important to them. However, the ML, ten, the ML team tends to care more about the model predictions. And the list of differences actually goes on and on. However, we also learned that it's okay to be different as long as we can work through these differences, find a common ground and come up with a model that both team agrees on and it's approved by both teams. And this model might not necessarily be the most optimal ML model in terms of the standard ML metrics, but it should be customized to meet a set of quantitative and qualitative criteria that are specific to that problem. Um, and also we learned that in order to better convince actuaries to accept our ML model, we, we need to compare our model results against industry benchmarks that the actuaries are familiar with. So what we showed in the previous uh, plot. And finally, we learned that in order to use our AI health score to select the lowest a low risk applicants, we need to have even further discussions with actuaries because ultimately we want to use the health score to help with the decision making process. We'll talk about uh, our underwriting validation process where we take a very different approach to get approval from the underwriters. Okay. Uh, thanks, Hannah. So uh, when it comes, yeah. So when it comes to uh, insurance in general, underwriters and actuaries are having very different mindsets. It's precisely because of uh, the different perspectives that we are uh, taking a different approach when validating our health score model with the underwriters. For the actuaries, as you can see, they look at things on a macro scale and use metrics on an aggregated level, such as incident rates that we just talked about. In other words, the actuaries are expecting their model to perform well on a large scale in the long run. In contrast, when, uh, in contrast, Underwriters work on a micro scale. When it comes to uh, insurance underwriting, they face individual clients, look at their demographic information and medical history, and then make their decision about their risk level on a case-by-case -case basis. Underwriters care about the ultimate decision of standard or substandard rating, but not so much about the incident rates. In addition, insurance underwriting is largely rule-based which can be dictated by the regulators or by the reinsurers. And it can vary significantly for each underwriter and for each insurance applicant. So um, I was just talking about how insurance underwriting was largely rule-based and then uh, their underwriters experience and dis uh, discretion can also play a big role when they make their underwriting decision. So in the end, underwriters have to have a good justification for their decisions in, in order to satisfy both our regulatory requirements and to provide 
a good explanation for their client. For example, if they want to decline someone from obtaining an insurance, they'd better give a good reason. Now, given the nature of uh, the underwriter's work, here's what we have done to validate our model with the underwriters. First, uh, we realized that ultimately, both our Lydia AI model and the underwriters will arrive at a decision for each applicant. More specifically, an underwriter will decide whether an individual's uh, insurance rating is standard or substandard, where a standard rating means that they have lower risk, hence lower uh, insurance price. Meanwhile, our Lydia AI model will use the health score to determine whether an applicant will go through the accelerated underwriting process or the traditional full underwriting. So now we have two sets of decisions. And when it comes to uh, comparing decisions in machine learning, we naturally think of the confusion matrix. On the left, we have the standard confusion matrix from machine learning. Typically, we would like to see a high level of agreement on the diagonal cells, and this will indicate that the machine learning model is making accurate predictions. On the right, we have adapted the standard confusion matrix to our problem of insurance underwriting. The rows represent what an underwriter would say about an insurance applicant, while the columns are the decision of our leader AI model. Just as a quick reminder, both standard and accelerated underwriting mean lower risk. So the cells to the left and on the top will represent people with lower risks. In other words, if you go back to the standard confusion matrix on the left, a positive observation would correspond to a high risk individual. Now, in order to fill in this modified confusion matrix, we have conducted a simulated underwriting exercise for comparing our model's decision with the underwriters. In this process, we first selected sample cases in our, in our data set and send these sample cases to the underwriters as if they were real people applying for an insurance product. The underwriters would then report their decision back to us, for example, whether they think someone is standard or substandard, or if they would outright decline them from obtaining the insurance product. After receiving the underwriters' decisions, we would carefully compare our model's decision against theirs in order to fill in that matrix. But we're not done yet. The most important part of the underwriting validation is actually extensive discussion with the underwriters regarding all the sample cases. More specifically, we would like to ask them why they're accepting or rejecting a particular individual. For example, are there any factors that affected their decisions in a significant way? Or are there any rules or experiences that heavily influenced their decision? We have had multiple rounds of discussion with the underwriters, which is represented by the loop in this diagram. Initially, we found some differences and discrepancies between our model's decision and the underwriters. We asked for their reasoning and attempted to incorporate these findings into our models for improvement. For example, by adding new features to reflect such domain knowledge that is specific to insurance underwriting. We would then repeat this process again with a lot of back and forth communication until the underwriters are satisfied with our model's prediction. Now, here is the summary of our simulated underwriting exercise. Again, similar to the classical machine learning confusion matrix, we would like to see a high level of alignment on the diagonals. In addition, for this particular problem, we would also like to emphasize that discrepancies are not necessarily and inherently bad, as long as we have extensive discussion about them and can provide valid explanations. Now going to the details, on the diagonals, we can see that for 70% of the cases, we were in agreement with the underwriters. On the top left, we both think that 22% of the cases are low risk. And on the bottom right, we agree that 48% of the cases are low risk. The remaining 30% are actually more interesting. For the 23% on the top right, our model think that they are high risk, while the underwriters think that they are low risk. And we do have an explanation for this. Recall that our model's output is a health score. And in addition, we need to select a threshold for the score based on our client's risk appetite. And this 23% this of discrepancy is simply due to a conservative selection of threshold. For example, in our case, our client may only be comfortable with people with a score being less than 0.1 to be given accelerated underwriting, rather than a larger group with score being less than perhaps 0.5. If the threshold is higher, hence more aggressive, then our model would put more people into the accelerated underwriting category. And this 23% discrepancy would become smaller. In other words, for this discrepancy on the top right cell, 
This can be justified by our client's conservative risk appetite. For the remaining 7% on the bottom left, our model thinks that they are low risk, but the underwriters think that they are risky. And this is actually where we can see the potential of expanded insurability. We would like to point out that the underwriters' decisions are not 100% correct, and our model may be making better judgments for these 7% of individuals. It may well be the case that our model's prediction is actually more accurate. And for this 7% of the people, they are actually eligible for the insurance product based on our model's prediction, but not based on the underwriter's judgment. In order to further reconcile this discrepancy, we have uh, had extensive discussion with the underwriters in order to understand the reasoning behind their and our model's decision, and to determine whether or not we can justify our model's decision. And one reason that we are able to better understand and justify our model's de decision is to look at medical interpretability. Without going into much details in these plots, all of them shown here demonstrate that our Lydia AI model is actually making medically sound decisions. In other words, if a medical expert comes and looks at this graph, they would agree that our model is actually making sense to them as well. We have shown this plot to the underwriters, and consequently, for some of these 7% cases, the underwriters actually agree with our model's decision, and they are convinced and also willing to change their decision, which have prevented people from obtaining certain insurance products. In other words, our Lydia AI model can actually help expand the population who can potentially benefit from insurance protection for their life and for their health. Now, here are the lessons we learned while, while collaborating with the underwriters. First, we realized that our model should be making justifiable decisions. In certain regulated industries, regulations, rules, or discretion often require that our model's decisions should be justifiable. Otherwise, a machine learning model whose decision cannot be justified will not be accepted. Secondly, in this process, we benefited a lot from extensive discussion with the underwriters. It is this type of two-way communication that has allowed us to better understand what is expected of us from the underwriter's perspective, as well as what can be done better and how we can better communicate our results to the underwriters. Then, through this communication, we have gained a lot of domain knowledge and experience. In our case, domain knowledge and experience in insurance underwriting. We were able to use this as validation feedback for our machine learning model as well as a potential direction for improvement. In other words, our model would not have been improved without the input of the underwriter's domain knowledge and experience. And finally, we learned that we should always be willing to change and update our model. In our underwriting uh, context, regulations and rules are constantly changing, and it is impossible to build one single model that would always remain relevant and useful. It is because of this willingness to change our model that we can better adapt and find a useful and relevant machine learning model. Now, let's take a step back and look at all the steps we have taken in this validation framework. We first built our Lydia AI model and then validated it with both the actuaries and the underwriters. For each step in this validation framework, we have adapted our validation approach to be specifically suitable for the stakeholder that we are communicating with so that we can better understand each other and then validate and improve our machine learning model. While this validation framework here is only specific to our case study in an insurance company, these steps can be easily generalized. With some modification and also knowing the needs of different stakeholders, a similar validation framework can be developed for other regulated industries. Now, let's look at the even bigger picture. We can see that the model validation framework we just developed can be easily integrated into the overall machine learning workflow. We would like to point out that Model validation is not a one-time thing, and we actually need to reiterate it many times with a lot of back and forth discussion before getting the final approval from all stakeholders. Therefore, it is very important that the validation framework can be easily integrated and iterable in the overall machine learning workflow. Now, up until now, we have been focusing on our case study in the insurance industry, but you might wonder why and how our case study is relevant to other heavily regulated industries, such as banking or healthcare? Well, here are some of the answers. First, when working in any regulated industries and when applying machine learning models to those real problems, there are always multiple stakeholders involved who have different needs and different perspectives. 
we as data scientists are only part of the decision making process and it's important to communicate and collaborate with all stakeholders. Secondly, among all these stakeholders, regulators actually play a big role, especially in heavily regulated industries. In many cases, regulatory concerns may actually dictate how machine learning work is done. So it's always important to keep this in mind when building, validating, improving, and communicating our machine learning models. Then, as a consequence of these re heavy regulations, there are always there are usually existing and well-established ways of work in those heavily regulated industries, such as insurance. These ways can be drastically different from the novel machine learning methods that we are using. It is important to recognize such difference and data scientists and professionals in those industries should try to find a common ground to work together. And one key reason that helps with the acceptance and application of novel machine learning models is that the model is making justifiable decisions because some stakeholders may not be comfortable with a simple black box solution. So we as data scientists need to put an emphasis on justifiable decisions. And finally, in regulated industries, um, incorrect machine learning predictions are likely to have different costs according to the stakeholder's risk appetite. In other words, we are training our model to make risk sensitive decisions. Hence, it is very important to incorporate our stakeholders risk appetite when building and improving our machine learning models. And finally, here are the key takeaways from a case study. First, we realized that machine learning black boxes can be very intimidating, especially in heavily regulated industries such as insurance. And in order to open this black box to professionals working in those industries, we need to demonstrate that our machine learning model is actually making sensible predictions and decisions which conform with the professionals domain knowledge and experiences. We also learned that it is important to build a two way communication channel between our machine learning team and other professionals working in heavily regulated industries. In the end, the final model are not necessarily selected by standard machine learning metrics, as we have seen but it should be customized to solve a specific problem and to solve the stakeholders needs. And finally, a good framework for validating our machine learning model needs to be developed and integrated within the overall framework so that they can be iterated and repeated many times. And that concludes our case study. Thank you so much for listening to our story. Whether you're a data scientist or a professional working in a regulated industry, we hope that what we learned at Lydia AI can help with your work in the future. Thank you, Spark and Hannah, um, for a wonderful presentation and the talk. Uh, we are ready to take some questions. Uh, we do have a bunch of questions in the chat. Um, I can read them for you and the team. Um, so Jennifer asks, um, how do you define and uh, quantify, uh, quote unquote, um, incident rates in healthcare? Um, maybe Hannah can answer this. Yeah, sure. So it, it actually depends on the, the way that we define incident rate. Like it it changes with different like products that we are looking at, if it's like mortality, hospitalization. And um, so we, we look at different um different cases, but it's the same that we we talked like the, the probability of something like like the mortality rate, for example, like how or like how often someone visits the hospital. So we have the the, those records and we have the duration that we're working with. So using those, we calculate the incident rates for, for different cases. Um, and then a question that's gonna be very similar. So uh, Daniel asks, uh, how is the incident rate metrics being incorporated into the order training? Uh, so the when we talked about like incorporating these metrics in model training, so before when we were training our models or optimizing our models, we were only looking at the the custom metrics. So we weren't even looking at the incident rate because you know we didn't know that we should look at the incident rate. So like after talking to our internal actuary, then we were um, we we calculated, we come up with the, those plots, and we had those plots, and then with um, things that we wanted to achieve, for example, like having that monotonic pattern. So it just allows us to go look at like different like scores and um, to to have that monotonic, to make sure that we, we are actually getting that monotonic pattern with the, with the optimized models or um, actually like minimizing the, the incident 
um, rates within like different like score brackets and instead of looking at um, a fun score or like accuracy or measures like that. So we still have those measures. It's not like we're only looking at the the incident rate, but it, this is just like additional metrics that we can we can incorporate when we're training and validating and optimizing the models. Um, so the next question comes from uh, Srikanth, and he's asking: Is the standard versus non-standard means a standard health insurance versus non-standard health insurance? Um, how do you quantify for standard versus non-standard? Oh, okay, maybe maybe I can answer this. So. Um, for standard and non-standard refer to um so it's let's let's assume that you have the same insurance product for mortality so death benefit and then for different people that uh that come to apply for this product they they will have a different rating depending on their demographics and also health status for example for someone you know as young and healthy as me i may get a very low price uh, but for someone for example uh which may be at age 60 or maybe they have like a long medical history then they might get non-standard rating. Basically, uh, that means they will have to pay a higher price for the same protection. And also, if they're really unhealthy, maybe if, it, if they have some uh, very serious disease uh, in the past, then they may not be qualified for this insurance and then just be rejected and then not get protection at all. Um, next question comes from Ali. Um, and he asks, uh, what tools and methods did you use to generate your model uh, explanations? I think it differs to medical explainability, maybe that they should at the end. Um, yeah, so um, I'm not actually. I'm actually not. Uh, I'm actually not quite uh, familiar with the technical details in in the in the model. So the technical explainability. But here uh, we have an example of um, medical explainability. So basically, uh, uh, for some of these plots, we. Uh, we want to show that uh, our model is actually making decisions that's also making sense to medical experts. Uh, let me just use one example. For example, um, the first plot. So in the first plot, we are plotting uh, the proportion of uh, a score against a uh, health score. So uh, horizontally, you can, uh, against age. So horizontally, you can see the age bins and uh, the bins here are actually representing the percentage of uh, of people falling into a particular score bin, and the score bins uh, on the top are representing higher scores, so they are they are of higher risk. And here you can see the general trend is that as you grow older and older, uh, more and more people will, will, will be assigned a higher score, so they are becoming risky. And this is important because we have not incorporated age in our model, and our model is actually able to pick up that particular feature. And that's uh, and the risk uh, the relationship between uh, risk and age is actually uh, uh, a medical effect or medical knowledge. And that's something that our model is able to pick up, even if it's not explicitly incorporated in the model. Um, so this is another great question from Daniel. Um, so he asks, uh, how do you explain the black box? Um, even you successfully to explain your model out uh, from, uh, from explaining your model output perspective, um, how do you explain your uh, ML model? Um, so again, like I just want to want us to uh, go back to what I said at the beginning of this presentation with like opening the 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 ML black box. We wanted to more focus on how you can actually open our work. So not the, not sharing the technical details, not sharing the technical things about our models, but rather like making sure that the the, the models actually like the results are reliable and it makes sense to to stakeholders that we're working with. And that was the reason that we come up this with with the validation framework to to take our model predictions to each one of these stakeholders, look at look at it from their perspective, and understand what what's that matters to them, like what are they what they want to see from our model, and address that um, without going into yeah like details of like um, the model itself. Mm -hmm. And then we also had the added benefit of the medical explainability, which just also like makes it easier to uh, to look at the um, look at that as well to justify our uh, results better. But the 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 goal I think for for this um, like the, the main takeaway is how to how do you open your your work rather than uh, like sharing the, the details the technical details. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, so the next question is, uh, it's going to be in two parts because uh, it's quite similar. Um, Salim asks, um, are your um, actuaries and 
underwriters working at your client's organization or do they work with your team? Uh, at your team. Um, so we do have an in-house actuary uh, who, who does all the communication work with uh, our clients actually and also underwriters. Um, yeah, but we don't have an in-house underwriter because um, uh, in terms of underwriting, it's, uh, so everyone has their secret rules and it's very important not, not to spill them. So uh, there's actually no way for us to know exactly what rules they are using, but we try to get as much information as possible from our discussion with them. Mm -hmm. Sounds good, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this might be then uh, relevant um, be but so uh, let me ask then in that case with someone who doesn't have any um, experience in those like how did they get up to speed with kind of just learning uh, is that through workshops for example and kind of what does the timeline look like um so this part actually has experience like um, that's yeah so, so. I, I do have a little bit of uh, experience in terms of uh, my, my experience is in property and casualty, which which is a little bit different uh, than healthcare. But um, yeah, so uh, uh, I agree. It takes some time, like, uh, especially uh, especially the back and forth with the underwriters, because uh, we want to discuss the reasons. We want to see why they are making uh, a particular decision, and. Uh, in terms of like, speeding up the decision, it's we are very fortunate to have our in-house um, um, actuary that translate those uh, information to us to to our ML team. And also, uh, I'm I'm also very fortunate to to the second member who have, can work on like the intersection of actuarial and data science, and that can also somehow build the communication bridge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so Yifai asks, um, how do you prove or guarantee that models meet uh, regulations? So we didn't really, I guess, talk about the regulation part. Like we, we just like we, we talk about actuaries and underwriters, and this is like the at the end of the day, like the clients are making the decision, and the underwriters, like they they they're gonna like it. All depends on their risk appetite and how like they're comfortable with the model. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like we didn't uh, go into the uh, the regulation part of it. Um, yeah, I just wanted to to add a little bit. So. Um, the regulation, uh, so all the regulations uh, in the in the industry are uh, our data scientists may not be familiar with them, but those information actually translated uh, to us via the actuaries. Because when actuaries, actuaries uh, for their work, they have to comply with uh, the regulations. So in order for them to accept our work, then our work has to be as close to theirs as possible. Or if there's some some rule that says uh, you cannot really incorporate age in your model, then they will tell us explicitly, well, you cannot do that, and then. And that's what we follow, yeah. Interesting. Um, so we have uh, a couple more questions before we close. Um, Rohan asks, uh, did you explain the impact of features in ML models? For example, um, health risks should increase uh, monetarily with uh, with age. If, yet, uh, if yes, then how? So this is something that we were actually like when for the incident rate plots, we were looking for for these patterns. And as Spark mentioned, our models are not using age as a feature. So like looking at the, the incident rate plots and seeing that we still have that pattern, even though we're not using age as a feature, was yeah one of the important checks for us. And um, that's, I guess, like one part of the actual validation, those like the expected patterns that we want to see from um, from the incident rate pods. And even if they're not incorporated in, in the model training or optimizing that, those are the, the things that, they, the, that we look for at the end, like after training the model, like before, I guess, like coming up with a final approved model. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, so Jennifer asks, um, it's a great question. So uh, what is kind of the current stage um, where the team is now uh, working with models, with um, um, underwriters and um, um, actuaries as well too? Like when and how the models are ready to make um, um, independent decisions? So I guess it's a lot of like communication, like when, when that's happened. So as a spark said, we do have our internal actuary. So the ML team works very closely with our internal actuary. Then we have the, the model that we think that it's good. Like we'll like take it to the, the actuaries. And then uh, we, we do have a lot of like discussion on what should be changed. And it's a lot of like iteration that happens in the process. 
And um, yeah, so I think it's, it's, we can, like the models during the development phase, like that's happening, but it's also like, even if the, that's, that's done and we're like, everyone is happy with the model, it always like goes back to the uh, risk appetite of the client, right? So mm -hmm. like what threshold we're choosing and things, and it, and it can't be always like completely independent from, uh, from the, the client side. So it's, um, but yeah. That's great. Well, so um, that's actually a good segue into the next question. So like it's common in our um, industries that some models are not at peak performance. They're not going to be 100%. Um, do you get challenged by your clients and stakeholders as to like, why is the case that you don't receive a very specific results? And then kind of like, how do you um, kind of manage and uh, navigate that? Yeah, so I guess, again, the, a lot of like discussions and a lot of back and forth and communication, understanding their perspective and understanding why our model is coming to that decision, why they, they have like they think of what um, like um, like that about that specific case. And mm -hmm. if we go, I guess, with case by case by case, then it's like the underwriters that we're dealing with. So uh, as like a spark mentioned, just with a lot of like discussions in either like it could be that we have to go back change um things in, in our model make a better prediction and, or it could be that we we have to convince underwriters that actually our model is making better decision and uh, so at the end of the day we need to come up with agreement mm -hmm. yeah um another another one i want to add is that um or so for for any like regulatory industries uh, our machine learning or, or any machine learning team that's not uh, familiar with that industry, they first have to get familiar with the problem and also get familiar with the uh, client's need. So it, it could well happen that our model's prediction is not uh, in alignment with the client's uh, expectation. And then this is why we have to ask, right? What are you expecting to see? And what domain knowledge are you using? And then we will try to incorporate those in our model building and improvement. And that's the the key way that we are trying to navigate through this kind of situation. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it just comes down to like understanding the business use case and kind of the expected results prior um, and working towards, I think that will definitely help mitigate and kind of um, work with the client's expectations for sure. Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, I'll just give the attendees a sec uh, if there is any more questions, but, um, but I just wanted to, um, say thank you for a wonderful presentation and for a wonderful conversation as well. Um, and um, and just for the uh, and just for the attendees, if you do want to learn more uh, about Lydia, uh, please do go onto the website. Also, uh, there is a boot section as well too on the left hand side, so please do visit us. Uh, uh, please do visit them as well. Thank you right. so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. I'll talk to you soon.